everyone and welcome to the Biggs Museum of American Art. Uh, tonight on our virtual tour we will be exploring post-mortem, death, and more death in the Biggs. It'll be great. Let's go ahead and get started. So starting off our tour we have actually a Peel painting. One of the Peel brother painting right here is of a still life with a broken watermelon and other fruit. And the reason we start with this is it is a very sort of basic type of painting that would be representational to celebrating life while it's being lived or also the knowledge of oncoming death in its eventuality. Uh, these types of still lives were done for a couple different reasons. Um, they were sort of a, an understanding of wealth, a depiction of wealth. It's showing plentifulness, it's showing bounty, it's showing food. <laughs> What's more wealthy than having food? And with that though, and kind of pairing with it a little bit, is these representations like this one here of broken fruit. Uh, just like the bounty and the plenty in life, the broken fruit is sort of a breaking of that bounty, a breaking of that life, a breaking of that youth, um, and the ending of life as a whole. So typically when we look at paintings that have broken fruit, and even more so in this particular painting, all the way to the left, we have a peach that is beginning to rot. Uh, these are all connoting signs of uh, mortality, signs of decay, um, and signs of this bounty and this plentifulness will not last. Um, these types of symbols are called memento mori. Um, and some people know that, uh, know that term and relate it specifically to classical artworks and high master's arts that have skulls in it. So think Hamlet speaking to the skull. These would be considered memento mori moments. You have that direct relation of death and decay with the living. And in here, um, and in a lot of traditions with our fruit still lives, that's done through the decay of fruit itself and the breaking open of fruit. Cool. So that's gonna be our introduction. Um, taking that idea of representing uh, life and the ending of life and carrying it forward, we're going to start looking at honoring and representations of death. So honoring the deceased in the different ways it was done throughout different pieces in our collection. And those are going to be located right behind me in this little section. Um, first and foremost, we're going to come to this piece over here. Uh, this is a textile art work um, and it is a sampler. A sampler is a fabric that girls and young women would practice embroidery on and build their embroidery skills. Um, embroidery and very decorative Embroidery was a sign of wealth. It was a sign of good womanship, uh, was the ability to work with fine details with a needle and thread. So in here, this is an embroidery um, practice. And that's what a sampler is, is where they would actually practice. What's important about this one is we have a list of names. And in these names, we have a various uh, color combinations. Uh, notable in this one is we have the parent name of Alexandria uh, written in black. And then on the brothers and sisters side, on the opposite side of our family tree, we have 
Margarita, Margaret, Margaret, and Sarah Agnes in black. Uh, these names are important because when sewn in black, these names are being represented as no longer with the living. Um, using black is, of course, a symbol of mourning because it's not reflective. Um, and that goes into a whole uh, sort of tradition of covering reflective objects so that the soul doesn't get confused on its way to heaven. Um, and also as a sign of mourning and covering how some people would cover the portraits of family members after they had passed. In here in the black, she is honoring the deceased mother and sisters by inscribing their name in black. Now, another way that this is important is a lot of times these samplers were the only way we could tell as historians the size of the family, the scale of the family, and who the family was. And so when we have a, uh, a young woman repetitively working on these samplers as she grows up and doing more with family trees like this, um, we can help, it can help us sort of figure out time period wise and how the family construct was changing um, because of how and who was blacked out over the course of the years. Now I want to stand for a minute on the actual representation in this sampler. Um, I have nodded to a family tree. Uh, if we look carefully, this is a lot of flowers. We have them here growing out of a pot. Um, this flower motif representing family, representing different symbols by the individual flowers, whether or not that is a forget-me-not, a rose, tulips, um, or possibly just other roses in this one, will come into play later and comes into play in a lot of different artwork. Um, this becomes, this sort of flower language really becomes big in the early Victorian and Gilded Age period and becomes incredibly symbolic to adding to the meaning. But this grouping and collection of flowers is not only representing uh, sort of life as whole, just as we saw with the still life that we just looked at by Peel. Um, it's also representing all of the flowers and beauty and life and representing single members of the family sometimes as well, so that you have your bouquet of your family and your bouquet of life. With that, we're going to move to a more direct representation um, of honoring. And that is going to be with this portrait behind me. This is the Ridgely portrait. Uh, it was once in Ridgely House. And this is of a woman who, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, she's about 26. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Haha, <laughs> numbers. Um, she's about a 26 year old woman. This portrait, while first seen, simply looks as if it's a, a portrait of a wealthy woman. She has her nice blue silk or satin dress. Um, she has a ton of lace. Lace, of course, representing wealth. During the period that this was made, this would be handmade lace. So this is an individual person or a team of person, people, team of people, uh, <laughs> working uh, very delicately to create that material. Um, she has her pearls. Pearls were, of course, another sign of wealth um, because before um, human manipulation of pearl production, uh, pearls were extremely hard to find. And adding to the wealth is the pearls on her necklace, while it is a choker, at least are depicted as matched pearls, meaning that they're all the same size throughout the string. So that would have been a great display of wealth, being able to not only afford pearls, but being able to afford a full string of evenly sized pearls. Now, the reason we have this portrait out in this collection, looking at postmortem and honoring and representation and symbolism, is because this is in fact a postmortem portrait. 
uh, this young woman, Sarah Wincoop Ridgely. Sarah Wincoop Rid Ridgely. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, she had actually died the year before this was painted. So this goes into a tradition of holding on to a family member and honoring a family member. So the same way that we had the names inscribed in black with our sampler, here we have a figure being continually uh, present in the house and continually part of the living world. Um, ways we can tell that she is in fact depicted as a post-mortem figure um, is actually the skin tone. While it was a while it was a sign of wealth uh, for women to be paler complexion, because the paler you were, the less you were in the sun, meaning that you were not laboring. Um, this particular complexion has a yellowish tint to it, a very predominantly yellowish tint. This is a tint that you see being used as early as the Italian Renaissance to represent the deceased. Um, it's just a yellowing of the skin. Uh, a very famous piece that uses this is actually a diptych where it's an Italian man in portrait and it opens up to have his wife. Um, the portrait itself is called Battista Saforza and her husband, Federico Montefeltro, it's just most known for Federico Montefeltro, but you open it and his wife is facing him. And this exact tone has been carried forward of this yellowish tone, uh, connoting death, because it's not typically a living skin tone color, while still highlighting that she is pale, she is wealthy. Now, this particular portrait because of the time period it was made in, we would have had a various, we would have had various different ways that this portrait could have been done. Um, sometimes there was a stand-in sitter so that you had basic proportions. Oftentimes that would be a family member. Um, more than likely with a portrait of someone of this uh, class, you would have a miniature done. You would have someone alive who could describe the person and the artist would be working off these compiled details in order to build this representation. Now, she herself is a representation of beauty as a whole. She has very almond-shaped eyes. She has a very egg-shaped face with a high hairline. And while we have her as a representation of an individual person, in order to keep her in the house, we do have her also as a representation of beauty as well which is important in the idea of keeping this person alive in memory and honoring them is in one way to make them as beautiful as you can. Moving on, we're gonna look at another type of portrait to just the other side of me. This portrait is of a young girl um, outside, dressed up in her finery for a child. Um, children often didn't cover themselves in jewelry. Um, still signifying a form of wealth with lace coming out of her sleeves at the top of her collar and at the bottom of her dress. Uh, this young girl outside is looking straight out at the viewer and she is gathering flowers is what this picture would look like at first observation. She's holding a basket with a whole bunch of flowers and a single white rose in one hand. Uh, a key difference in this portrait from the other portrait, even though one is an adult, one is a child, is that this portrait is considered uh, folk art. It comes from our folk art gallery on the second floor. And while our first portrait used constructed symbols of beauty, it still represented the individual human and notable as an individual as a whole. On this side, when we look at folk art, these are artists that are either not academically trained artists and are more so sign painters and not particularly painting portraits, or they are people who are trained and choose to depict sort of the folk art style 
which is very focused on symbolism. So it's creating the figure as a symbol as opposed to adjusting the figure to be symbolically beauty. Um, in this picture, for example, I'm gonna break that down if that was a little bit confusing. We have a very realistic face. Uh, this looks like an individual person. Uh, it's very detailed, very highlighted. Um, it has a fairly lifelike uh, complexion, whereas the other one did not. What's important to note about this one is it is believed that a sibling or cousin sat and modeled for this portrait. Uh, because while it is depicting a young girl, that particular girl is deceased at the time that this painting was done. However, in it, she's depicted as alive. Um, so there was a sitter for it. And while her face is very realistic, her body is flat. Um, and that's something very notable of folk art portraits is this sort of um, sometimes described as uncomfortable flatness. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a pairing of 3D qualities and flat qualities. Um, a lot of children who come to the museum uh, don't like the folk art gallery because of this flatness. It looks weird to them. Um, but that's what's happening. So we have a very realistic face, but her body itself is flat shapes because it's the person that's important, not the fact that she has a body. Of course she does, because she's a person. Um, but as we come down into the painting, the main way we can recognize that this is a postmortem is this flower held in her hand. In one hand, she has a basket full of flowers, just like we saw on the sampler where there was a pot full of flowers surrounding the family and the garden of life and all of the different elements of life and happiness is represented with the basket of flowers. Now, importantly, in her opposite hand, so in her left hand, she has removed a single white rose. And this is where sort of uh, the language of flowers becomes very important because that single white rose is a representation of youth and of innocence. And so by having this portrait done with her separating a single rose and more importantly, a single white rose from the bouquet of life and the bouquet of her family, she has separated herself her representation of youth, of innocence, has been removed from the bouquet of life. Um, and that is our key note here to this being a post-mortem painting of this little girl. So carrying forward with this idea of representation um, and honoring, we're going to continue to a more ephemeral and ritualized honoring. So with that, we're coming up to this front table. And I will only be talking about half of this table right now. Uh, <laughs> so looking at caring for people, honoring the dead and creating a femoral experience of taking them with you, which that is what we're really and truly seeing with the two portraits we just looked at, was the idea of keeping the individual in the realm of the living. So we are gonna look at some of the fashionable ways people would do this. On the table in front of me, we have a couple pieces of mourning jewelry. And with that, <laughs> uh, with that, we have two different pieces. We have a ring and I'll be picking these up in a second. Uh, we have a ring and we have a pendant. Now mourning jewelry was done as a way of keeping the person who had died close to you. So I'm gonna start with our morning ring. Let me make sure it's facing the right way. Here we go. So this morning ring um, is inscribed with dates and a name. There we go.
Um, and so this ring is a gold and ivory. Nope, uh, white glass enamel. White glass enamel, thank you. I'm gonna jump in for a second. I'm sorry that we're not getting um, great enough detail. And everybody, this is Ryan Grover, I'm the museum's curator and, um, and the worst cameraman ever. <laughs> but, um, so this is uh, morning rings. They are typically gold. There's glass enamel sort of baked into the interior or into the sort of central band of this, creating a freeze of words. And you'll have to take my word for it or come and visit and see it firsthand because it's always on view in the glass gallery upstairs. But it's for Peter Mallard. And it was, uh, it shows that he died in 1763. It, uh, glass enamel is usually not a great substance to use for jewelry because it will crack eventually, but this was never really meant to be more worn for longer than just the mourning period after a person um, passed away. Yeah. Thank you for that. No problem. All the back story on that. Um, I know a lot about practices, but not that specific item. Uh, so thank you, Ryan. Um, so jewelry was another way that people would keep the deceased with them. That's, um, I'm going to describe it as a more simple way, even though it's not. That is quite an understatement for creating a tiny enamel ring with names in it and dates in it. Um, the other one we have is a type of jewelry that becomes popular, particularly in the Victorian period, um, with the height really being the 1860s. Now, by comparison, the 1860s is the early American Gilded Age. Um, the American Gilded Age is specifically a time in American history from the end of the Civil War to the stock market crash of 1929. Uh, so you'll hear me trade back and forth between Victorian and Gilded Age um, because there's an overlap. So I'll, I tend to denote Victorian if it's earlier than 60s, uh, the 1860s. Um, and the reason I do that rather than saying the antebellum period is because the morality and the culture and traditions of the Victorian period are what carries over into the early Gilded Age. Um, yeah, which I'll, that's a different story. So <laughs> in this second piece of art uh, here is we have a brooch and this brooch is actually going to be made of human hair. And while at first um, people tend to be like, ew, gross, why would you ever do this? It's a terrible idea. Um, it's the same idea of a soldier going to war with a picture of a loved one the same thing as if you watch Greece, uh, they tie the girl's ribbon or ascot to the car. It's the same idea as a lot of people keep the kid's baby shoes or the first haircut and keep that somewhere. It's that idea of this is something that actually belonged to this person. It was a part of that person. So you're keeping that person with you. And in this particular brooch, uh, the hair has been groomed and similar to embroidery, it's been knotted to actually make wheat stalks growing up out of the ground. And if you look carefully, each of the different fibers is a different color. This can be done naturally through a single person's hair. I mean, if you look at mine, there's like seven colors in it. Um, but equally, sometimes the jewelry is done and will go as big as full hair wreaths that will encompass an entire family. And the way this was done was either by women brushing their hair. Um, you may have heard growing up, brush your hair a hundred times. Uh, it's a terrible idea today because of the type of shampoos and conditioners we use. But back then they would use these fine, fine hair brushes and you would need to brush the oil from your hair all the way down to the ends. And they would clean the brushes out and actually have a tiny hair holder it sounds so crazy, I know. Uh, they would have a tiny hair holder that they would store these pieces of hair and they would kind of wrap them up into individual bobbins um, and store the hair. So people could, typically women, could learn then to embroider with hair and to create three-dimensional pieces and jewelry and artwork out of hair. So that way, uh, when a person had died and you really only have a limited hair supply, uh, you could 
take a chunk of someone's hair, typically not much. Um, for something like that, you're looking at maybe that amount of hair. You would cut it off and you'd be able to weave it into these tiny brooches or into bracelets or into lockets. Um, and this gets so advanced that you get hair wreaths oh, that big, completely compiled out of hair. I worked at a museum that even had part of the wreath made out of the horse's mane. Um, uh, so it gets wild, but also these pendants would be done as lockets often um, in the later uh, Gilded Age period when photos became more hands-on and quickly uh, able to be done, that the locket would open, the inside would have a photo, and the back of the locket would have a piece of hair uh, braided or turned into a stone. And so they would actually make the hair look like a cut of emerald uh, or would have a princess cut hair um, into these brooches. Uh, so it gets, it gets wild and crazy. Um, they made books for patterns, just like you would get knitting patterns today. Um, yeah, crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Uh, I could go on forever about that. But continuing forward with this idea of ritual, we have here a painting, had to double check, had to lean in, looks like a print for a second. Um, we have a painting of the Old Swedes Church in Wilmington. And we chose this picture because it is deteriorating in the actual picture here. Um, this church is still functioning today. Uh, but what is predominant in this particular painting is this graveyard. And while graveyards have been around forever, not necessarily, but for a very, very, very long time, uh, the idea of how a graveyard is utilized has changed over the years, with the height of the graveyard really being in the 1850s and through to the 80s. Um, you have this idea that a graveyard is more of a place to stroll, to go outside, to go on night, nice walks and be surrounded by those who were once with you. Um, I liked a, a real way to think about it is Central Park with tombstones. Um, and it's, it was supposed to create sort of these nice natural environments that worked as a permanent memento mori. So a permanent idea that the individual who's still living would be able to, I'm gonna say commune with the dead. Uh, that's not the correct term exactly that I wanted to use, but the idea of being around the dead and bringing them back into your world and having a representation of them still with you throughout your life. Um, and that it would be a peaceful, uh, trip from the city and from town. So you're removing yourself from everyday hustle and bustle activities to then create a quiet, reflective, uh, pensive place, uh, which is, of course, no, no longer really how many people use this uh, space. But that's one of the reasons we chose this picture is it shows sort of this idea of decay while still exhibiting this reflective place to go and enjoy life. Um, yeah. So the final part of this section, looking at ritual and honoring the dead, um, I'm going to give my, uh, my trigger warning. The images I am going to show you may be considered graphic uh, by your standards. Um, in a minute, I will be displaying post-mortem photography. So I wanted to give everyone a warning right now that I will be showing you post-mortem photography. If that is not your bag, feel free to look away. You can still listen, it's pretty cool. I will not stay on it too long. <laughs> feel free to ask me all the questions you want about post-mortem photography. I know too much about it. So I'll start with this. We have printed out one of the post-mortem pieces in our collection here at the Bigs. 
Uh, don't worry if you've never visited us. Uh, these are not typically out on view because that would not many people want to go to a museum and stare at postmortems. So this particular postmortem is more traditional. This was a photographer based in Wilmington. Um, and he actually did a lot of pictures of sort of camps and a lot of living people doing fun living things. However, he had this side collection of postmortems that he would take. Now, with the rise of photography in the late 1800s, they were already achieving shutter speeds that we have today. Uh, it took less than a second to capture your photo with really no major changes to photography um, other than the box camera coming in in the 1960s with Kodak, like the Kodak self-contained box camera. Before that, there was no major changes um, nor had there been since until we hit digital cameras. Um, so the technology has pretty much been the same since the time that these were taken. So these were quick, they were instantaneous, and they were a lot cheaper than hiring an artist to come draw a deathbed scene or to do a postmortem painting like we saw before, which is why a lot of times when people think of early Gilded Age and Victorian period, people are just like, oh, they're so cryptic. There's just dead babies everywhere. Um, it's because more people could buy these pictures. Um, so they wanted to have it. You wanted to remember what your loved one looked like. So this is your more typical. A lot of times these will be babies and children in postmortem pictures. Oftentimes, um, young kids and babies would be buried in white. Once again, referencing that youth, that innocence, and also white's really easy to bleach on young children. So that's what primarily their clothes were. Now, if you look carefully at this postmortem, the way they do these is they often try to sit up the figure like they were still alive, like we saw in the Ridgely portrait, where they're trying to make the, the child, or in this case, the baby, not look dead. Um, and so they would sort of sit them up, sometimes tie them on. What you can't see in this picture is there's actually like a, a small string going around so that the baby is in fact sort of propped up on this chair in the background that has then been draped with black. Sometimes you also have the mothers uh, draped just in a black blanket and will be holding the child. Uh, those are commonly referred to as ghost parents. Um, but yeah, so that's more of your traditional. Now, the second picture we have is not printed wrong. It is a double picture. And the reason I chose this one, this is a man in a coffin um, at a wake. And the reason I chose this particular painting or not painting, photograph, is because this was done in, the, the term is escaping me, but it was done- Stereo Opticon. Thank you. It was a done in stereo Opticon. So what that means is this photograph was made to be put in almost like a view master situation. Um, there would be a lens, there would be an arm, and the photo would sit at the end of the arm. And because the lenses were uh, convex, inside this viewing port, this image would become three-dimensional. So this photograph was made to look like it was 3D. And um, I played with a lot of these. You can actually find these images very cheap, like stereo Opticon images, very cheap at antique stores. Um, not for too much, you can actually find a stereo viewer. Um, they're very realistic, they're very 3D by the angles changed. So I picked this picture because that's odd. Um, this is actually the first time with a lot of study in postmortem, I have ever seen a stereo opticon picture of a wake. Um, so that is very unique to the Biggs collection um, individually. I'll flip those over. Uh, if you looked away, I am done showing postmortem pictures. <laughs> you can feel free to join us again. Um, and we're going to move on, and Ryan is going to talk 
um, about vices and murder. Hey everybody, Ryan again. Um, I'm the curator here at the Biggs Museum um, and, um, and I am uh, Kristen's lovely assistant today. Um, I'm gonna pan this direction just a little bit so that we can talk um, about murder. <laughs> Well, murder and vice. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, just some uh, display some of the objects that we have in the museum that kind of talk about um, ways of killing people, beautiful ways of killing people, because of course this is an art museum, but um, also ways um, uh, sort of the, the, the sort of seedy underground basically of, um, of the, uh, the, uh, the, art experience here in Delaware. Um, so first of all, um, we do have a couple of guns, really terrific guns in the museum's permanent collection. This is uh, what they call a Pennsylvania long rifle. Uh, these were being produced not often, but, um, but what often enough uh, in the late 1700s into the 1800s, uh, different types of makers for different portions of the guns, anything from the carving and really fine detailed carving of the, um, the what do they call it, the, the stock here, as well as the barrel maker, as well as the silversmith that was creating silver inlaid into the wooden comport, um, portions of the gun itself. Um, really, really remarkable stuff and remarkably detailed decorative work. Um, I'm gonna get you to come in close to this area here. And you can, this is a uh, brass inlay as opposed to silver inlay, but there's a combination of both within this particular example. And it's just pretty incredible the kind of work that's done here. Does, however, still make you remind you um, that this is a weapon, that this was a powerful long distance weapon that people potentially could have used um, in, um, in, in my nightmares uh, <laughs> in the 1700s, 1800s. And it does sort of remind one of uh, Dawn of the Dead colonial style. I also um, wanted to point out, we have a really fantastic silver collection. It was a regional silver collection here at the base. And um, there were a couple of real jewels in there for, you know, for your Halloween scare tactic, excuse me. Um, and I don't have COVID, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the first one I wanted to show you or the one that I brought out specifically for this was this little dagger. Um, how would you call this particular kind of knife, like this sort of small scale knife like this? Um, so originally this would have been sheathed, would have been tucked on your side. Um, we have lost the sheath in this situation, but the work that you see here, the silver work in the handle and on the end um, was created by a guy named Philip Singh. He was a um, 18th century, late 18th century silversmith in Philadelphia. Um, and his marks are here and here. Really remarkable, beautiful little piece. I'm sure if you got close enough, you could still see the blood of his victims on the blade. Um, Cause you know, we keep it real here at the Biggs. But um, it is um, just a really, really remarkable little thing. This is actually one of a number of different kinds of silver mounted weapons that we have within the collection. And all of them made by the Philadelphia Delaware makers. Who knew that we were so stylish in our murder tactics here within the first state. Um, I came across this really bizarre little thing. There's a couple of sort of little bizarre things that came from Sewell. Um, Sewell Biggs, the museum's founder, um, he started the collection here. The sort of core of the collection, the first half of the collection was begun by Sewell. And, um, uh, and so when I first started working here, I had to bring in and accession a lot of things into the permanent collection. And I remember inventorying this. Um, this is only about six months after Sewell Biggs himself had died didn't die from any of our weapons. But um, he, one of the things that he gifted to the museum was this very strange little pistol candle holder. So I think, I don't know, I don't know much about this particular object, except that it still has its little um, candle in it. But I think that this was an operational pistol at one time that then had been converted basically into a little handheld candle holder so that you can move around inside the, inside the house or wherever you're at. What's interesting to me is that the original flint of this, uh, so this is what would cause the spark that would then ignite the gunpowder inside the pistol so that you would sort of 
to project the uh, little round bullet, um, the original flint is still in place, which I find so endearing and so adorable about this thing. We almost never display this, but I was really delighted to bring it out of it, um, out of the vaults, as they say. Um, so switching gears a little bit from these representations of murder weapons, um, I wanted to show you some of those sort of slow death methods that we have in um, beautiful examples of in the museum. Um, and that is uh, representations of human vice. Um, I mean, obviously, and I know one that many of us are indulging in quite a bit right now because of COVID-19, but um, liquor, of course. So we have lots of different kinds of interesting vessels within the museum that um, represent sort of, you know, consume, consumption of different kinds of um, wines and beers, other kinds of beverages as well. But there have always been sort of really artful representations of the way to sort of um, to, um, to drink your liquor. Um, this particular goblet, this really fantastically ornate goblet, was gifted to the museum by a silversmith, um, a friend of mine named Michael Gallmer. Uh, we did an exhibition of his work a couple of years ago. And he um, actually, I have to say, he gifted this to me and I ended up giving it to the museum. So, um, and, um, and it'll be here to, uh, to uh, honor that artist for all time. Um, Michael's a fantastically generous guy. But um, one of the things that I want to sort of point out is not only is this sort of beautifully cast sort of silver object, but it is also um, gilded on the interior. So the gold on the interior of the cup keeps the silver from corroding over time. And you find that a number of uh, silver vessels like this um, made throughout time have these sort of gilded interiors. Um, but it's just um, a wonderful way to slowly die. <laughs> Um, the other thing, and this has to be truly the one of the weirdest things that we have in the museum's collection, this is an opium scale. And one of the things that I find so absolutely endearing about this is that written on the lid is actually a, um, someone wrote a little note to themselves that says that they are able, that the, um, what is it, one pint of brandy equals one ounce of opium. So you could pick your pick your poison, literally. But um, these little scales, and they're really, really delicate. One of the strings is already broken, but you can sort of see that the scales would be lifted. You would hold it from this little, um, this little sort of center piece here. I don't want to hold it by the fibers that normally would be. But then there are these little sort of weights and tiles underneath to be able to give a good idea about what sort of weight of object you are sort of trying to dispense with. Um, this predates Sewell, not to give any sort of ideas about what Sewell might have been doing on the weekends, but, um, but it is a really, really fun sort of like collectible um, object. We do not bring this out very often either. So this is, um, this is a, very, um, a very, very special moment for the weekends. <laughs> the last thing that I wanted to tell you about murder is the, um, this painting right behind me. So, um, we have at the Biggs Museum a really fantastic collection of American illustration. So these are paintings that were created to become prints that would then be featured in printed newspaper, magazine, and book formats. So they are accompanying images to literary works. And there were a number of really important industrial schools in um, the Philadelphia and sort of nor and northern, or northern Delaware area um, starting in about the 1880s up until about the 1920s, 1930s. Um, those departments of those major schools then become sort of graphic arts departments, but for a long time it was just called illustration or the mechanical arts. Um, one very famous school was based in Wilmington, um, started by a guy named Howard Pyle, and he, one of his students we um, have really well represented here at the Biggs Museum, a guy named um, uh, Frank Schoonover. And so Frank, we actually have one of the biggest collections of Frank Spoonovers in the world. And the piece behind me here, this was a gift by a woman named Betty Hobbs in Wilmington. And it is a fantastic murder scene. Um, this woman that you see here has just murdered this man on his back. And another individual has, come, has busted into the scene so that you would be able to recognize in this sort of grand moment of energy this sort of this dramatic climactic moment within the story. And the title of this piece is the woman who looks like she's sort of clutching her pearls, the woman's um, crying out, you know I had to do it, don't you? <laughs> 
So very funny, um, kind of schlotsky, kind of kind of melodramatic today, but um, but a terrific, super high drama um, image nonetheless. We were really really delighted to have it. One of the, consequently, one of the reasons that we really wanted this for the collection as well was that all of the small objects that you see in the background, the vase, some of these figurines, this um, uh, what we think is probably a lantern used in a railroad, the clock, all of the many of these objects are actually still in the the um, artist studio of Frank Schoonover in Wilmington, which is now operated by his grandson. And so, some of these objects that were included into the storyline basically of this painting are still available to be seen and viewed in the studio. So it was just this great sort of continuity and this sort of um, idea of sort of props and creating spaces and sort of, you know, adding to, adding to this, to the narrative of the storyline using these individual objects. Not to mention murder. <laughs> Awesome. So um, give us a pause to second, um, one second, and we will get Kristen back to um, round out today's talk. All right. So welcome back to me. Uh, we have our final piece for you. I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll keep it very brief. Uh, in the beginning, we started with representations of memento mori in everyday life. Um, we're going to end with sort of that same idea of memento mori, but keeping it moving forward into monument. Uh, in this painting, which is in the month of June by Henry McCarter. Henry McCarter. I got tied up on his like middle name. Uh, <laughs> Henry McCarter. And here what we have is this is this artist uh, was trained in Philadelphia and actually ended up going to France and becoming a student of Henri Toulouse-Lautrec, who is most famous for his Moulin Rouge dancers, um, and then kind of coming back. But during his time in France, uh, this artist became very interested in expressionism and this idea of sort of abstraction of reality. This particular scene it's believed is actually a painting set in the famous um, like star uh, photographer, celebrity photographer uh, Schlegel's garden. And so it's believed that this was set in his garden, but what is different about this painting that uh, we can't find a representation of in his actual garden are all of these crosses. Now it's believed that being named in the month of June uh, is actually nodding towards a, an armistice um, that ended sort of the confrontational sides of, uh, France, Germany, and Italy at the end, well, in June of 1940, so in World War II. So it was ending sort of a war standoff that was happening between France and the Axis in the 1940s. And so it's believed that by using this garden, once again, returning to the Garden of Life, uh, you could always draw parallels to the Garden of Eden, but placing it in the actual, an actual location of Schlegel's garden, which had become famous, Sieglitz, sorry, Sieglitz garden. Um, by placing it in this actual location that had become wildly famous in the late 30s, in 36, he had an exhibition of his flowers in his garden actually at the MoMA. Um, by placing it in a real location, it's bringing the gravity to a specific location in France and honoring the ending and creating sort of his own version of a memorial to World War II by the addition of adding these crosses into an existing garden scene. And on top of that, as I said, a famous garden scene, creating this, this um, monument in a way and a memorial 
in a way to soldiers of World War II through that edition. And that kind of takes us as a whole through different types of representations and different items we have in the museum that have to deal with death and memory and mourning and murder. Um, that's for you, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> murder. <laughs> murder. Uh, here at the Bigs. So, you know, if you come by, when you come by and you visit us, uh, you can look around every corner and find something uh, dark and mysterious in almost every gallery we have here. The more you know. Uh, with that, um, we are ready for any questions. If you have questions about a particular piece or anything like that, uh, feel free to type it into the box. We have a few minutes. Um, and when we have a question, you will hear uh, Catherine asking it. So that's not just a ghost voice. Um, that is in fact a person. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to type. Um, let us know. Kristen, we have one question from Carolyn. She asks, how much did a portrait after death cost? A lot. Uh, <laughs> I don't have an exact figure for that, um, but you would have had the fees not only of hiring an artist to come out and to physically paint, uh, so artist fee hours, you have then on top of it, the material cost. And during the time that these paintings were created, particularly that Ridgely portrait was created, uh, that's still when artists would be mixing their own pigment. So they're actually going out and for those blues, they're finding uh, natural dyes, things like the lapis lazuli stone, using different flowers um, for stains, grinding it into a powder and hand mixing the ingredients um, often with oils and eggs. Um, so it's a, it would be a lot in summary. I don't have an exact figure for you. We have another question from Deb. She asks, can you talk about the term memento more? Yeah. Um, so the term memento more really comes from it's, a, a Latin term, um, meaning sort of a, it's where we get memento form. It's, it's, a, it's an item of death, a memory of death. Um, so it's this idea of not done in a morbid way of being like, death is around the corner. Or um, murder. Or murder <laughs> is around the corner. Um, but this idea of you can die any second, so enjoy living. So it's actually a, a happy thought. Um, it's, like I said, it's most famously depicted in the scene from Hamlet where he's holding the skull. Uh, you also get it in the dance macabre uh, during the French Gothic period, uh, which is a bunch of skeletons sort of dancing and they look really funny, but it's this idea of the dance of death. Um, so it's this idea of death surrounds you all the time. So enjoy living. Yes. Okay, we have another question. One second. From Cheryl. When brass is inlaid in wood for a gun, is the wood carved first and the brass made for it or the other way around? Oh. Join me, Brian. Yeah. Uh, more than likely, the, um, the barrel, the sort of metal barrel was created by one maker and the wooden stock was created by another. They were joined together, usually by the wooden stock maker so that he can make alterations. But then the carving, the sort of um, the extraction of the wood in order to create the inlay, that might've been done by the wood carver themselves or by um, 
whoever was providing the inlaid pieces. And, um, and you could um, more than likely, especially with the brass objects, you could probably find other examples of that same cast brass object on other guns, but each one would be sort of slightly modified in order to be able to fit the gun. So it all kind of depends on how you just sort of meld these pieces together. But oftentimes the works that you see are uh, being produced in multiples so that you would be able to provide them over and over and over again to several different kinds of guns. The silver pieces, however, the silver inlay, those are kind of unique on each gun that I've seen. Um, and you don't see a lot of duplication of that. So I don't know exactly where they're coming up with some of these super, um, some of these uh, very ornate, uh, super decorative kind of uh, silver inlay pieces. I'm not sure exactly where the design sources are the, of those things are, um, but they seem to often be very unique. Great question. All right. Um, so with that, we're going to say thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any additional additional questions about mourning, ritual, honor, or murder, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, my email is k-m-a-t-u-l-e-w-i-c-z at bigsmuseum.org, um, and I will get you answers. Um, once again, I want to say thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you join us for some more future programs. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.